Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to The Power of Our Story. And we are a place of safety and connection for those who protect us. We do this through sharing stories in a healing and judgment-free zone. Um, today, I'm so honored to have um, the guests that are on today. Barry Zwarenstein, uh, a good friend of The Power of Our Story, will be facilitating this talk. Um, I'm going to let him introduce our guests, but I just want to thank Barry. Barry is a psych psychologist now, but he was also a combat medic in the Rhodesian War. His story is unbelievable. Um, he has brought so much wisdom uh, to those that are transitioning, and it's just it's it's such an honor uh, to have him here to facilitate this talk today. So, Barry, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Sarah. And I mean, today is just an extraordinary day, you know, because one, it's a family day with Dan and his family. And, um, you know, it's been an absolute gift to know Dan and his wisdom. And Dan, you may not be a mental health professional, but trust me, you're a mental health professional in the real sense. You know, Thanks. the kind of guy that's walked the walk. And I think we need more folk like you guiding people forward. And um, well, so it's, a, it's amazing to have a brother, uh, Dave, uh, because we're both from the Bush War, and I don't think I've ever been on online with somebody from my own generation. And, uh, you know, today represents folk on the ground and guys in the air, and I think it's just such a perfect combination to begin a conversation. So, Dan, welcome. I'm going to um, start off with a little bit of your biography that um, Sarah put up. Um, so, Dan Sheehan said, Dan, is it Sheehan or Sheehan? Sheehan, how you go? You should go with Sheehan. Sheehan, good. So Dan Sheehan, okay, very sensitive <laughs> about those things. Eh? So Dan Sheehan served 12 years in the Marines. He flew an AH-1W gunship during the 2003 invasion of Iraq and returned for a ground combat tour in 2004 as a forward air controller with Marine Corps Special Cooperation Command, Detachment 1, the precursor to today's MASAC. He was awarded several individual action air medals and a bronze star for his action in combat. After leaving active duty, Dan turned to writing to process his combat experiences and published two award-winning books that address the human costs of war on those who fight. His memoir of flying gunships during the invasion of Iraq, which was after action, the true story of a Cobra pilot's journey it won multiple awards and became required reading for all Marines when General Berger added it to the command, Commandant's professional reading program list in 2020. Dan's second book is a self-help book for people who wouldn't be caught dead reading a self-help book, and we'll get to that, Dan. Continuing Action, A Warrior's Guide to Coming Home with a foreword by best-selling author and PTSD expert Dr. Jonathan Shea is a noble shell examination of a critical gap in the modern warrior's preparation for combat and provides pragmatic guidance for veterans to overcome the challenges of coming home after war. Dan and his wife, their two kids, and a fat-headed pit bull, Mutt, live in San Diego, when he's, and when he's not writing, he's usually surfing, spearfishing, or talking to the school principal. So, Dan, just to welcome you, and before... I get you to say anything. I, I found a beautiful quote to lead in. And that, that quote was, the journey of healing and becoming whole can be challenging. We confront our darkest demons, leap across chasms we thought we could not cross, and come home to places inside ourselves we never knew were there. It takes courage to step onto this path and every single bit of our strength to keep going. And I want to say, I think it's very difficult to do this path. And, and certainly the power of our story represents the importance of tribe. But also, Dan, you know, your books are the bridge for the darkness that people struggle through and those that don't make it. Um, and, you know, if we're looking at 20 to 35 more a day who can't make it, for me, your books are critical. And I thought today would be an extraordinary opportunity to really dive into your story. And I thought in terms of creating a process, we could start off with what I'd call before action, which is um, just a bit of your backstory and how you got into the military. And then we could move into after action, because after action, is, as you've said, really sets the tone. It's, it's you as the person in the territory experiencing 
what everything, every, what everything everybody else has experienced. So it names it. But the beautiful thing is your honesty and your transparency in letting people inside you to see the impacts and feel the impacts. It's profound. And that book really sets the beginning of this journey to recovery. And then we'll stop and let people ask any questions. And finally, we'll move into um, continuing actions, which is really the workbook. And, you know, as we've often talked about, it's it's easy to read books, but the journey back to recovery and back into life is hard work. And we can never stop it. We have to keep going till the day we die. So it's a pleasure to bring you on and have you paint this roadmap back to recovery and to give more hope to people that are stuck anywhere in the world today, even in the darkness with no hope. So, Dan... Um, welcome to the power of our story, and um, we'd love to hear a little bit about you, Dan. Your backstory. I mean, you've got all your family here, so um, lying is certainly not going to be an option. And yeah, um, call me yeah. out on that for sure. Yeah, they they will then. So yeah, I was a really good I, I, kid. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so go for it, Dan. Let's hear more about you. Yeah, there's Ellie. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Barry. This is a, a real honor, real pleasure to finally get to uh, have this conversation with you and with the with the entire tribe here at uh, Power of Our Story. Um, before I kick off, I want to say thanks to uh, the mental health professionals who have chosen to, uh, who will be listening to this or seeing this at some point, um, and Barry, Sarah, everybody who's who's in this uh, in this area. Um, Thank you for using your your skills, your knowledge, your education um, to help the veteran population. Uh, it's really it it means a lot to have folks who dedicate themselves to to uh, helping us move forward after after what we've been through. And I just want to put that out there uh, first and foremost. Um, so, all right, <clears throat> who's this Danshi and who's this shoe shine guy? All right, so I grew up uh, as a as a Navy brat. Um, dad was a Navy pilot. Um, we kind of come from a long family of, of Navy folks. My grandfather was a, a Navy pilot and my grandmother was actually a, a wave during World War II. Um, and uh, I think I figured out around uh, sophomore year, senior, no, I guess junior year in high school that uh, I wanted to join the military, but I wasn't quite sure what, what I wanted to do. Um, and the closer I got to um, to it, the more that started to crystallize. And I said, all right, I actually think I want to learn how to fly. Um, I remember seeing my dad's NATOPS jackets, these giant books with all the operating procedures and emergency procedures and everything that you need to know about an aircraft. I was like, absolutely mind blown that somebody could know that all that information. Um, but I figured if dad could do it, then maybe I could too. So I put, uh, put that as a goal. Um, and uh, after college, got uh, commissioned in the Marine Corps. And uh, after about six months of TBS, the basic school down in Quantico, went to flight school out in uh, Pensacola and then Corpus Christi. So that took about two and a half years, about, yeah, about that. And then uh, got my wings. Um, my father pinned the same set of wings on me that uh, had been... My, my grandmother had bought them for my grandfather and they had his winging date engraved on the back. And then my grandfather pinned them on my dad's chest and they have his winging date on the back. And then dad pinned it on my chest with my winging date engraved in the back. And then dad was able to take that same set of wings and pin them onto my younger brother's chest. So they, uh, they've got a lot of They've got a lot of dates um, engraved in the back of that those gold wings, so it's uh, it was a pretty a really special day. Um, after flight school, uh, came out to California and learned how to fly the Cobra out here. For those who don't know, the the uh, H one Cobra Whiskey Cobra was what I flew, um, and that's a two seater helicopter, front seat, back seat. Uh, it's got a 20 millimeter cannon under the nose, and then it fires a uh, an assortment of unguided and guided unguided rockets and guided missiles. Um, it has also been retired from the service, so my aircraft is no longer actually flying. Um, the Marines now have a, a Zulu model, which uh, is a is an improvement upon what uh, what we flew as the whiskey. Um, 
I ended up doing two uh, Western Pacific deployments here and out of uh, Southern California. So I uh, got on board the ships in San Diego and floated out for six months uh, doing contingency operations in the in the Middle East before 9-11. And then uh, I came back from my second deployment. Um, actually, that was the second one was after 9-11, but uh, came back from that second deployment, was home for about three weeks, and uh, we got turned around to go over for the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, so floated back over. Um, there were no ports of call or stopping anywhere on the way to Iraq. We uh, we basically just went straight from San Diego to um, to Kuwait, offloaded and in Kuwait and spent about three weeks to a month getting the aircraft ready for the uh, for the fighting that was to come. And then on uh, kickoff day, we flew across the border and and uh, provided close air support for the next three three and a half weeks um, during the uh, during the run to ba Baghdad. Um, all those events I write about in uh, in After Action. Um, came home from that uh, second deployment and pretty much got order got orders pretty quickly after that to uh, go over to the Marine Corps Special Operations Command Detachment to work as a forward air controller. Um, we that was a brand new unit, so we went from standing up, just uh, you know, being formed to uh, being in combat in about nine months. So it was a whirlwind uh, training experience um, back here stateside. Uh, and then I was back in back in Iraq in Baghdad, Al Kut, Najaf, um, and some other spots uh, in 2004. Uh, and after that deployment, came home and uh, prepared to go back again. The um, you know there was no no end in sight for what we were doing. But uh, debt one ended up getting disbanded in 2006, um, just before we were going to go back over to Afghanistan at this point. Um, and so uh, they, the debt one was a proof of concept unit um, that was set up to prove that the Marines could provide something special to Special Operations Command. Um, and we did that. And so they disbanded us and then they stood up the, uh, the, the larger MARSOC unit, um, which exists today. And then uh, following that, I went back to flying, went to uh, the training command here in uh, Camp Pendleton and at the RAG, uh, the replacement air group, and taught new pilots how to fly the Cobras. Um, and then I left active duty in 2008, uh, flew for a civilian company in Florida for a couple of years, and then uh, after that, stayed home to take care of the kids. And uh, when my wife restarted her career, and that's kind of where my whole charade of being fine, and I put that in quotes, um, started to fall apart. You know, it's easy to, it's easy to, or it's easier, I suppose, to ignore the baggage you're carrying and the changes that are occurring when you're facing another combat deployment or when there's another threat to focus on. Um, when those go away, it becomes an awful lot harder to lie to yourself. And, uh, it was in that uh, in that relative peace and quiet of uh, of raising two kids um, that uh, that I decided it was time for me. I had to figure out what was going on, what had come home with me from Iraq, um, and that's what started me on the journey that uh, that yeah that I'm still on. You know, that's figuring so, all and this that's. Out. That's an amazing story. I mean, first of all, just generations of flying and generations almost of genetic wisdom <laughs> in in your background. Um, what I was interested in, the transition from being in the air to being on the ground, um, how was that for you? So I loved it. Honestly, it was uh, I didn't under I didn't quite recognize um, at the time. But and Dave, you'll probably remember this feeling you're in a, you're in an aircraft you're elevated you've got weapon systems you've got eyes you're looking out you you think you're in charge and you think you have a lot of uh, global situational awareness as to what's going on what you don't realize until you're on the ground is that you are really really exposed like there is nothing to hide about nothing to hide behind and i mean dad used to talk about being able to poke a number 2 pencil through most of his <clears throat> aircraft and, you know, bullets are significantly harder than that. And uh, that, that always kind of surprised me. But then, 
you know, the same thing was true in a lot of the components in my aircraft. Um, certainly didn't have a bulletproof uh, anything on it, except for the seat that I was sitting on. Um, but when I was on the ground, you know, I was surrounded by the let me back up for a sec in the aircraft as well. If I got hit, my my co-pilot's five feet behind me. There's a there's a giant instrument panel between us. He can't get to me. You know, I'm the only person that's going to be able to put a tourniquet on whatever's bleeding out, and uh, provided I'm able to do so. There's no no help is coming to you in the front seat or in the back seat if you're back there. Um, and so it was a real different experience when I was on the ground because I was able to move, able to hide, able to get behind cover. And I also had some of the most highly trained medical uh, corpsmen around. These, um, uh, the Sark corpsmen that we had were just incredible. And I knew in those, in those situations that if I got hit, if I wasn't killed outright, chances are were good that I was gonna, I was gonna make it back, um, because those guys were just so good. I mean, Barry, that's what you gave the men in your stick. You know, they had you there to take care of them. I had, I had my my corpsman uh, with me to take care of me, and that makes it a lot more comfortable. Um, you don't feel so alone. Mm. Uh, and you know, I didn't recognize that exposure that I had. Um, in the aircraft until I was on the ground and sometimes looking up and going, dudes, you better get out of here. Yeah. I must admit that it's probably the first time you brought awareness to the fact of that aloneness up in the air. Um, and then just that sense of tribe and protection on the ground. Um, and I'd never really thought about that. You know, when we were on the ground in four man sticks and in, in the Rhodesian bush, we, always you were surrounded by at least three other guys. But that sense of aloneness, I've never really come to. And, and what's your, when you reflect back on that sense of vulnerability in the air, how, how is that for you? And we'll come more into that in after action and continuing actions. But what's your reflection on that? You know, it's one of those, one of those ones where you're like, man, I'm glad I've got that. I'm glad that's behind me. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, my hat's off to the guys who have those realizations and know know just how exposed they are and keep going back. Um, and that's something that at some level, I think, on the, at least on my first tour um, flying in, in Iraq, I was like, I didn't feel that I was that exposed. Yeah, I had that there's that facade of control that that uh, you have around you. Um, that didn't get stripped away until later, but, you know, guys like Dave who keep going, you, I'm sure you've had that feeling, Dave, and, and you kept going back and that's a, uh, that's a level of courage that, um, you know, there, 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 there are levels of courage and that just, that just, uh, ratchet, ratchets it up there when, uh, when you know exactly what can happen and keep going back. And do you find that looking back on that vulnerability, did that form quite a strong component of your after actions and continuing actions? So the vulnerability didn't per se, but I think what it did do was it allowed me to see that the that those two combat tours were very different experiences for me. And uh, that is what eventually as as we go through this we'll get to the point i think where um i'm able to come to the realization of what had come home with me and what was bothering me um and that difference it, it was the difference really between those two tours because in the uh in the aircraft yes i'm vulnerable yes i'm i'm exposed but i'm also making all the decisions about who we kill and who we who we don't um, because in the front seat, I'm the only one that has uh, the, the weapon sensors. I can I can see through magnification, through the magnification of my sensors, things that my co-pilot can't. Um, yeah. And so the uh, the decision making, decision to kill or not to kill, um, 
and then the, the physical act of doing so um, and seeing it in, in high magnification were, that was what had come home with me. But it was all mixed into this whole two combat tours, different things, a whole bunch of other stuff happened. So it was really a journey and a process to get to that point to go, what is, what is bothering me? What is this? And seeing the difference between the two um, tours on in the air and on the ground and realizing that my air tour was far more impactful for me from a, from a mental, in, I'm sorry, from a, like a, a moral injury standpoint um, than my ground tour was, was surprising to me. Cause I always thought that, man, if I'm on the ground, that's going to, that's, that's really in the shit. You know, that's where it's bad. That's where, you know, if anything's going to be sticking with me, it's going to be from the ground. And it wasn't the case for me. It was the, it was the opposite. And that cued me in and started going, okay, so what it, it helped me narrow the, uh, narrow my focus and get to that point where I realized, Hey, it's killing. Killing is what bothered me. And it's not that we didn't kill during the second tour, but notice I say we. In the second tour, it felt like, yeah, I'm calling in airstrikes and I'm on the radio. I'm talking to the, to the birds that are dropping or shooting for us. There's a level of, there's a separation there that, uh, that didn't exist when I was the one shooting or dropping. And, uh, and so all of that just stems from understanding that there's a different that there was a difference between my two tours and then digging into what what that difference actually was. Yeah, and I think what you highlight is and and that was my experience, you know, when I look back on coming out of the bush war in 1977 and then to the present moment, sometimes it just feels like this mix of a soup and I can no longer tease out what's in that soup. It's it's just a whole lot of ingredients that as being at war and then coming out of war with all the other impacts and changes and challenges and even wars in itself, internal and external, as we created change and conflict and and the ripples of the war just sort of trailed through our lives. And and I hope today that we can actually start to pull that soup apart. Um, also, Dan, you know, what comes to me is when you talk about the 20 mil and Dave, uh, Dave Shirley, um, for those of you that have just come on, was a... Um, He's, he's the old bloke with the glasses um, and the red shirt. But Dave was a, a chopper pilot in, in the Rhodesian Bush War. So he was the bloke. He was like our guardian angel above us. And in the Rhodesian Bush War, we had the 20 mil K car. And I always, when when you mentioned that, it, I always remember that sound of it was that's a, <laughs> as those kind of mini hand grenades were just hitting the ground. And, yeah. and, and it brings to me that, it's not just memory, it's also sound, it's smell, it's taste. And those things almost get embedded in, in our soul. And I mean, I always feel that we can manage killing, but killing is also a wounding of the soul, whichever way we want to look at it. And the soul can only cope with so much wounding before it really starts to creak and groan. And I think this is a good entry into... Um, into your after actions and what's what i loved about the book is is that statement where not all wounds are visible and i think that's what we're really talking about because what's not visible we don't know is there and as you said dan i think it's when we move into the silent moments of our lives when our body starts to release memory that stuff starts to come out and it can come out i, I often call them claymores you know it's like a claymore that just starts going off inside us can you talk about um, if we move into after action now, the sort of things that wounded you, that gave you wisdom, where you found strength, and in many ways, it formed the grounding of what you were going to draw on in continuing actions. So I think it's a good good place now to move into that part of your life. But I'd like to just stop for a second to ask if anybody's got any questions, because it'd be great to have just moments where we can dip into um, things people have to ask. Has anyone got something to ask Dan at this point? Dave, hit your sound if you, yeah. Okay, Dan, what's really interesting here is you went to Timor, you then went to Iraq, and all the battles you were involved in weren't in your home, in your backyard. It's And I just find that so interesting that 
this is maybe what messes with people's minds, especially I see a lot of folk. I think I was, we were really lucky. We fought in our back garden and we knew if we didn't do something about it, we, we were going to be dead. So, and I really sympathize with you where you came from. And do, do you think that had any effect on you, the fact that it wasn't your backyard? If you'd been doing this, say, over in the east coast of, of the USA or the west coast, do you think it would have made any difference? And do you think you would have been more aggressive and more angry? Because if I don't get these guys, they're going to get me, you know? Yeah, Dave, you bring up a great point. And I think that uh, that would have been a very different experience uh, if it had been in my backyard or if it even had been a, a more mortal threat, you know, against me. Often I was looking at, at enemy soldiers, enemy combatants, men that I was there to kill across, you know, two or three kilometers of, of desert. And, you know, they have AKs. They're not going to range that. I've got missiles. I've got guns that can reach halfway there at least. And I mean, I'm looking at them going, I'm, I know this isn't supposed to be fair, but man, this feels really like beating up on somebody who can't defend himself. And, you know, that's a, it's a naive way to look at war because war is not, it's not supposed to be fair. You're supposed to turn the other people into goo and then, and then do it as quick as possible and then go home. Um, and that's how, that's how war can be. That's as, that's as, as sterile and as, humane as war can be, as if you kill the other guys as fast as possible and then get, get it over with. And, you know, that's just, it's different when you're doing it though. And um, yeah, if, if those men had been invading my country or had been insurgents in my country, that's very different, very different experience. Um, I, I expect it would have been anyways. The, uh, a lot of that questioning that I did as to whether to shoot or not to shoot, I think would have, at least I would have moved past that question probably faster, um, or it might not have even uh, come up at all. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And Dave, thanks. Great question. So, Dan, let's let's move into um, after action, because after action is really the territory where, as, you, as you've raised, it's, it's really the hunting of men. It's not fair. I think that's where the wounding happens. Um, that's also where the wisdom happens in a funny way. If you can um, go into that part of your life now, because there, I do know that there were experiences that really impacted on you profoundly. Um, and if we can look at that part of your your world now, and, and the, really the world of your book, After Actions. Yeah, um, definitely. So After Actions started as my kind of personal unpacking of, of the experiences. Cause as you mentioned, Barry, the, you know, the soup analogy is great because you put all these ingredients in and initially you can taste them all. And if, if you eat a soup before it's sat for a period of time, it doesn't, it's not right. It doesn't gel. Um, but after a day or two, and then man, that's really good because all those ingredients have become something bigger than the whole. Well, that's what exactly what happens with, uh, with your, our memories from this time. Um, you know, initially they go in and you think you can, you can extract them and you'll, they're always going to be really, um, really unique in your mind and you'll be able to, to access them. And then they all kind of blend together. And pretty soon you can't remember what day, one day from another, you just have this overall sense of that time. Um, and that's, that's one of the challenges of, of, unpacking those things afterwards is that you have to, you have to basically do that in reverse. Um, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, so after action was, uh, the thing that kicked it off. My younger brother was, was a Cobra pilot, um, in the Marines as well. And he was on his second overseas, his second combat tour, uh, in Afghanistan when he went down, um, he and his co-pilot both survived the crash and were rescued uh, with with relatively minor injuries. Um, but I got the call from my dad. I was in Virginia at that time. Um, got the call that morning from dad just saying, hey, Dave's been in a crash. He's fine. He's in the hospital. He's, he's recovering. Um, he's going to be okay. Um, but that my, my reaction 
to hearing those words that Dave was in a crash, I reacted as if he was dead. Like all those, all the emotions, all those things that had been building up in me, that pressure that had been building up in me for, for years now, because that was, that was years after my, my tours, um, just all came pouring out. And there was that part of me, the conscious part is like, dude, what's wrong with you? You're fine. Dave's fine. He's going to come home. He's going to be laughing about this. You know, what are you, why are you sobbing on the floor? Um, and it was in that moment that kind of that separation of, of between my conscious and unconscious minds and reactions that I was like, something, I, something is definitely not right. Um, but I still wasn't quite ready to, to, uh, to figure out what that was. Um, I still, I packed it away and, and said, no, that, that was just something weird. I'm not sure where it came from, but I can, it, it's not going to happen again. Started telling myself that. And then uh, a couple of days later, saw my, my son um, kind of looking up at me from the kitchen and uh, he had mir taken the same image, same uh, kind of uh, stance that I had taken leaning against the door jam. He's 18 months old and he's, he's already mirror imaging what I'm doing. And I just looked down at him at that point. I was like, I have to figure this out. I have to delve into whatever it is that's bothering me. Cause if I don't, I'm going to screw him up and he's going to see how I react to things. And he's going to see how I, maybe I don't react to things because I, that was one of my coping mechanisms was I can't predict what emotion is going to come out. So I'm going to tamp down on all emotions and it's safer to not, not get involved, not get, uh, um, not ex feel anything than it is to allow these, uh, these uncomfortable emotions to come out or things that aren't even tied to my reality, my, my date, my current reality. Um, and, uh, I figured that that was probably the worst thing I could do is to keep hiding it, um, and in doing so, I would pass whatever burdens I was carrying. I was going to pass it on to my son and then to my daughter when she when she uh, was born. Um, so that started me down the, the writing road to figure it out because I wasn't I didn't pick up the phone and call the VA and go, hey, I got some something I want to talk about. Um, I went I figured, hey, I can I've got time. I've got I'm safe. I'm, I'm stable. I can figure this out on my own. Um, and so I turned to writing to do that. And. Uh, that turned into 420 pages of, of uh, stuff that nobody was ever going to want to read because it's not good. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, is, it is just all straight, flat, just what happened, when, where, why, um, but not how it, any of it made me feel. Um, I were, ended up working with a, a developmental um, editor who coached me through um, a lot of that breaking down those barriers inside myself and figuring out, trying to um, extricate where those emotions came from, what what emotions I was feeling at various times, um, and then tie them to the uh, the physical actions that I took in the cockpit. Um, that's where the, that's where the value of, of, that's where my story that I had written actually became something that might be of value to somebody else um, to read. And that turned into after action. Yeah. Um, but what I the main thing that I came away from with after action was that the actions that I took in combat, the things that I did, the things that I saw and experienced, smelled, heard, tasted, all of that generated emotions in me in the, in real time. None of those emo I didn't allow those emotions to be expressed. And through a process that we're all familiar with called compartmentalization. You know, I stayed focused on the job at hand. I stuffed the emotions away. And I'm not going to make the enemy's job any easier for him to kill me by getting distracted by any of this. So all the things that I wrote about, very few of those emotions occurred in, in consciously in real time. They were there, but they immediately got stuffed away. Um, and I was under the impression that Stuffing them away was the last time I would ever see them. This was, boom, it it strikes, it's hot, stuff it away, move on. And that's that's the strength of compartmentalization. That's the, the man, I'm, I'm good at this. I can do this job and I can move from one 
what I recognize now is one traumatic experience to the next without any, without a hiccup. And that's what I took pride in. And for people who operate in those environments where you have to be able to move from one traumatic experience to the next in a, in a split second and stay focused because people's lives are depending on it. That's our bread and butter. We love compartmentalization because it's, it's our superpower. What I didn't know, however, was that that's only half the battle. Compartmentalization is like putting on a tourniquet. You got to, you got, it'll keep you from bleeding out and you can keep doing what you need to do, but you don't live your whole life with that tourniquet on. You get to the doc and you get them to, you get help from a, from a professional if you need it. Um, but compartmentalization is that mental tourniquet and it requires you at some point to decompartmentalize at some point you have to go back and you got to take those uh you got to let those memories those emotions come out um and it's a it's a critical step because when you have those compartmental compartmentalized emotions when you've stuffed everything down it doesn't matter if it was last week or 25 years ago or longer those emotions have the same power in that day that they did the day that they were given birth. The day that that event happened, that you felt that way, when those emotions come out, they're going to feel the same. And that's a, you know, that makes them potentially dangerous, but something that you, you need to be aware of when you do this. But there's no safety in leaving them sit either because they're kind of like a... Uh, like a toxic waste dump in your inside of your psyche that they're they're going to leak out they're going to leach out and then pretty soon they're going to come out in in the groundwater of your emotions so they may manifest it may be anger it may be um it may be shame whatever the emotion that you're that you felt may come out like a like a little like a little sapper it comes out later on miles away and shoot you from the side. You're like, where did this come from? I was just watching a, a video with my kids and now I'm crying or now I'm screaming at the TV. What, where did this, you know, you, it gets very, very uncomfortable and you learn to double down on compartmentalization. You go cold, you go distant because you can't trust what emotions are going to come out. So you tamp down all of them. And that just puts the lid back on that pressure cooker and it, the pressure builds and builds. And for some, you may never have to, you, your pressure cooker may never blow yeah. or it might, you don't. And get Dan, yeah. um, in, in, in you, if we take the lid off, if you're able to, so you were in the air, you were on the ground, there were experiences that you kind of integrated. There were experiences you compartmentalized. I know, there was one specific incident you talked about a bloke on the ground and then and kind of the realization that initially you thought he had a weapon and if you can talk about that and other incidents so what were your core impacts in terms of situations and memories um in after action in when you were actually in the fighting encapsulating and literally as you say it's stacking it up one thing after another what if, what did you pull out when you started to to heal and take the tourniquet off. So the most important thing that I healed was that, or that I felt was the, the shame and, uh, of having killed. It was, it was, it wasn't seeing dead bodies. It wasn't seeing, you know, the, the difference was when I saw a man and I thought about him and go, that's a person that I need to kill. And then I sent that, then my brain went from there to how's the, how's the best way to kill this person? Is it the 20? No, the 20 is broken. Is it have gas shoot rockets at it? No, because that's going to, I can do it better with a missile. And which missile do I use? Do I use a tow? Do I use a hellfire? I'm going to go with a tow. And then I go through that decision. I'm, you know, there's no there's no face popping up or there's no shadow pop popping up around a dark corner that requires an immediate action. This is me going, Hmm, this is how I could kill him. I could kill him this way. I could kill him that way. I think I'll do it this way. And then 
pulling the trigger, telling Gash, hey, this is what we're going to do, pulling the trigger and flying the missile into that person and then watching as the torso separates and the, and the pieces go. You know, that's that's the level of magnification that I that I have. Um, and it was the. Yeah, I, I guess that that shame is the, the feeling that that re- generated in me um, that I didn't uh, didn't allow to come out. That's what I stuffed away and uh, and kept away for a long time. Um, yeah. You know, there were there were plenty of I mean, even when Gash fired from the back seat, he fired the rockets and cut a man in half in front of me. That doesn't that didn't bother me. You know, it was like, oh, wow, that was a great rocket shot. But when it was me, it was different. And it was. Yeah, that's what that's what came home with me. Okay. Out of that. And I think that shame is a massive one. I think another thing that came to me was. You know, I remember when the four of us, um, I think it was one of our first patrols and we were up on a hill and um, we saw what looked like um, about eight or 10 people walking in overalls with objects over their shoulders and, and they looked like terrorists. And so the tracker and I, um, that well, he was a stick leader. Um, w- the two of us took off after them and he went around the hill. It was about 200 meters away in the bush and I, I went on top. And there was a moment of about, and he said to me, lock in on somebody, but don't fire until I take the first shot. And it was maybe 30 seconds, but those 30 seconds seemed to go on forever because I remember lying on the hill with a weapon and I had a guy in sight down below. And I remember feeling nothing. And it really described exactly what you were feeling from the air. And in fact, I felt quite a sense of excitement. It was like cowboys and Indians come alive. And I think the thing that I always struggled with and the thing I tracked in all the veterans and current serving that, that, that I was working with over the past 20 years was how we reconcile the two parts of ourselves. The one part that can be loving human beings, great fathers and husbands, and the other part that are still capable of killing with no feeling or no apparent feeling. And I think that tension is sometimes quite a, a killing factor if we don't integrate that and learn that the two can coexist together. And I'm wondering what your experiences are at that level outside of shame. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, at some point, you know, I remember it's father, fatherhood brings a lot of this out. And I remember holding my son and seeing those hands, the same hands holding him that were the same hands that did all those other things. And, it just there's a there's a it becomes a circle there that you can't really ignore um, uh, at, at one point. But what I ended up doing with that um, with that and trying to trying to come back whole uh, or understanding what had come home with me um, and heal from it, I turned all that into a you know the concept of the the burden of peace. Um, and there was a, a statement that I came up with that was supposed to be kind of my healing mantra. It was something that I that I came up with, like that allowed me to understand my um, understand my wound, what had come home with me. And I tried to do it in a way that I, at the time that I thought was that was healthy and healing. And it was, pretty simple. It was good people don't kill. I killed. So what does that make me? And I meant that to always remind myself to do good, to do better, to always to move forward, to be strong, to be the best dad I could be, to be the best whatever I was trying to be. You know, I had something to make up for. And so I could do that by, I could atone by keeping my, making sure that I did everything right from there on out. Um, And that was a, it was helpful at the time. um, But as I kind of get into and continuing actions, it, uh, it actually was a, was my stuck point. It was the point that I, it became a, a, 
a short circuit of of type of a sort that prevented me from actually moving forward and and fully understanding what I was uh, what I was dealing with. Um, so Dan, I mean, it it feels like, and I think this is where a lot of people get stuck: first responders, veterans is that they get stuck in the after action. And I think I've always felt that there's a quality of the wound that if worked properly, gives us insight into compassion and care. But as you said, you can't just reframe it because underlying that are all the emotional contents, all the, it's that soup that starts to become acidic and almost wears into your bones and your soul. And that's the painful part that I think a lot of us don't want to go there. I mean, I, I still feel that even today, going into grief is very uncomfortable. Anger, irritation, reframing, service are fabulous. But if we don't go underneath that, it starts to wear away all those protective layers that we build up on top of our experiences. And so I think this is probably a, a good place to get into continuing actions, which is how how did you progress forward? Because between after action and continuing action, that's the place that people lose their lives. That's yeah. the place that even as we're speaking now, there's somebody sitting locked away in a unit or homeless, and they're one centimeter away from ending their lives because they got stuck between the two journeys. So if you if you can talk a little bit about how you progressed forward in continuing actions, because I think that is also where hope lies and life lies but i think i always want to add that you have to earn the right to get to the end of the journey and it's hard work and it's painful work but i've always said that when we are in tribe we no longer are alone and when we no longer are alone when we're no longer alone we are surrounded by those that mentor us forward so today we're in tribe and in your book we are in tribe with you so what was your story about moving forward how did you go back and clear out the emotional content the guilt the grief the loss the pain um yeah talk to that yeah so when i finished after action i thought that was it i thought hey i figured this out i'm good let's move on okay that was that was a lot enough of this um and for a period of time that it felt right it felt like yes that was good now i can move on to happily ever after um, but then it didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't last, um, feelings of, of, um, shame, feelings of being a fail of, of being a failure, you know, depression, all those things kind of came back in and, uh, it's like, oh, there must be there. A lot of me was going, something must be wrong. I need to fix something, but I didn't think it was I needed to fix me. I didn't I thought I had done that already. So part of it became a oh, you know what? I just need to move back to California. We just we were in in Virginia at that time and uh I told my wife I was like, "Can we we need to move back to Cali. We need to go back to San Diego. Um I need to be back by the ocean. You know, that's where a lot of my healing took place." Um and she agreed and we were able to make it work. Um, she was able to, to switch her job um, in order to, to make that work. So we were able to get back here. And uh, for a period of time, it felt great. And then I was able to surf. I was able to dive, um, able to do all the fun things that I like to do uh, with the ocean. And then one day, um, well, caveat that having my wife has, has played an integral role in, uh, in my journey um, she'd known me before, before combat and then all the way through. Um, and she's also a Marine helicopter pilot. So she knows, knows where I came from. Um, the, uh, one of the, the only caveats she put on us coming back from, uh, moving back to San Diego was if that doesn't do it, you got to talk to somebody. And I said, no problem. That's so far down the road, and I'm so sure that this is going to fix everything that nope, I'll I'll agree to that, no problem. Um, so yeah, six months or so after we moved back, and I was standing on the on the bluffs overlooking our our uh, the ocean, had the car filled with my my spear fishing gear, my surfboard. I could go and do anything I wanted to do. The kids were in school. I had hours to do whatever I wanted to do, and I didn't want to do anything. 
it all felt too hard. It was too, I was just in a dark, dark place. And, you know, I was like looking out over the water going, shit, I guess I have to talk to somebody because this didn't do it. I'm not fixed. The changing, changing zip codes didn't magically fix me, surprisingly enough. Um, so uh, I went to the VA. I went to the Veteran Center um, here out in San Marcos. And uh, I was not optimistic. Um, I didn't have a high, uh, didn't have a high um, level of, of hope that the VA was going to be able to help me out, but it was the first step. Um, and I couldn't have been more wrong. And I walked into the vet center and, you know, was able to sit down with a, uh, with a corpsman uh, who had been, he'd, he'd been a senior chief in the Navy, served all his time as a corpsman with the Marines. He knew exactly what I was talking about from the get-go. He knew he knew my background. He, I, I had this fear that I was going to spend weeks talking to somebody who'd never served, who had no idea um, what I was talking about, and it was completely unfounded. Um, so I talked with, uh, went in there and, and went through a couple periods of, of counseling, and uh, well, probably probably a month or two, um, where we kind of get to know we get got to know each other, and then. Uh, he was able to get me to that. Well, I got to that point where I was like, Hey, this is what I've been holding on to for a long time. This good people don't kill. I killed. So what does that make me? And he, he zeroed in on that really quickly and uh, asked me if that might be, you know, is that what, do you think that might be your stuck point? As he explained, once he educated me on PTSD and told me that's kind of what you go through this loop and where you're, you get to a stuck point where you stop cognitively thinking about what's happening and you just go straight back to the next step that you've already presupposed. And that's what I was doing with that. Every time I would, would make a mistake or would fall short of some goal that I'd set for myself, usually as a, as a parent, um, I would come back to, you know, I, I, promise not to scream at my kids. I screamed at my kids. I killed people. I'm a bad person. And it wasn't, there was no logical connection between those things, but in my mind, that connection was, was ironclad. Um, so what, uh, what my counselor was able to do was just kind of reframe that for me and go, what's the, when do good people kill? And I was spring loaded to just go off on him. Cause I didn't think anything so simple as, as, changing the wording a little bit was going to make an, an impact on me. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized it did. That's the phrase that I had come up with that I meant to be a, meant to be kind of a, uh, a support, something to, to fall back on when I was feeling like, man, maybe I'm not doing so well. Hey, I need to do well because I've got this background. Um, what I what I had actually done was damned myself. Each time I thought good people don't kill, I killed. What does that make me? There's no way to answer that without going. Well, you're you're screwed. You killed people. There's no there's no other way that that and that question can be answered. Um, and uh, so when when my counselor was able to reframe that into when do good people kill, it brought a whole different flavor to that. It's still my burden. It's still what I carry with me, but I'm not automatically damned for for having done so. It's something that I can I can take with me as a uh, yeah. It's it's a part of me, but it doesn't have to define me, and it doesn't have to direct me from from twenty plus years ago. Now it doesn't have to direct the course of my life. And then. Um... That coming home and starting to realize, you know, because you come home, your protector is is a powerful thing because that is the core essence of a warrior. Um, then you come home and you realize that, in fact, the protector is has brought the war back home and you're seeing that in your children's eyes, you're seeing it in your wife's eyes. And that loop, I think, that you talk about, I think it's the combination of realizing that we now become the enemy in our own homes combined with the loop we get stuck in i think it's that somewhere in that interface where everything starts stacking up piling up and coming out 
where people are really at high risk. How was that for you when you realized that in many ways you were becoming the enemy within your own home? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a, a very stark way to to put it, but it's it's absolutely accurate. Um, because you know, I, I thought about it from the standpoint of, you know, something came home with me from Iraq that I don't want in my house. And you're right, the reality is that's that's one way to look at it. Something came home with me. The other part is I came home and I don't want to, I can't be in my house and I can't be with these people because I'm, I mean, I'm not worthy. I'm not trust. I'm, they can't trust me or I can't trust myself. And all those things. Yeah. They, they make the darkness look a lot, uh, a lot more attractive than it sh otherwise should be. It's tough. I mean, because I think, you know, that protects uh is such an important part and, and, and in many ways a gift of who we all are. But when we see that we're starting to impact on those that we love, I mean, that has a double kick to it because it's not just the men. And I think there really is a brotherhood and a sisterhood, whichever way we want to call it, in, in combat. But when we look at our wives and our children who are not, they're not military. You know, they're the people we love and there's a vulnerability in that. And when we start to see that we are eroding them, I think that the pain of that and the awareness of that is profound. And I think that's often the point at which the guy goes upstairs and puts a weapon in his mouth because he no longer sees his way through that darkness. Can you talk a little bit about the journaling part of your continuing actions? Because you you took your story to someone and I think you were very fortunate to, to be with someone who understood and I think that's always been a big thing for me is that uh, mental health professionals working with um, veterans and first responders need to be acculturated into their territory rather than coming in with just their modalities and certificates on the wall. So that's one point. But yeah. you did your time with somebody that helped you understand and reframe. How was your journey then with the journaling? Because continuing action is really your way of refinding your healing and yourself as a person in your life. Can you talk to that? Yeah. Um, so what I was able to see in hindsight after looking, you know, as I started writing continuing actions is like, how did I get to this point? And what, what roadmap could I lay out for someone else to follow? Because it's not enough to just do it yourself. You need to be able to, you need to help somebody else along. Um, and I looked back through it and saw that, uh, and I'll get to the journaling stuff at, in a moment, but I kind of, um, that comes at the end of, of the, the kind of the three phases that you need to do, um, it, that I needed to do. Um, and that was one was I needed to address the, the physical challenges of coming home. Next was the, uh, the emotional and then getting into the spiritual, the spiritual and emotional for me kind of ran together, um, but uh, those three avenues, those three different um, kind of sections of of a person needed to be addressed. And for me, they needed to be to be addressed in sequence. I had to quiet the the physical after effects of of combat, the the hyper vigilance, the irritability, the uh, inability to relax. Um, all those things had come home with me. and, uh, I'd stumbled on a, the, the healing, the, the, uh, I stumbled on diving, free diving and spear fishing as a, as tools to use, because after I came out of the water, I, I was hypothermic, but I was also calm. I also, I felt good. I felt calm because that energy that I had been uh, putting out in the water for the last several hours had worn me down and brought me down to the point where I could relax. Um, and I only saw that in hindsight um, when I went back to to try and figure out what it what I had um, how I had come through that phase. But once that that physical stuff got quieted down, um, I started noticing the the emotional idiosyncrasies, and so that becomes the next level of hurdles that you need to need to address. Um, and for me, that was. I addressed that uh, by compartmentalization, uh, by decompartmentalization, 
by writing down all these things, writing after action and assigning, taking those emotions and reactions out of the, of the pressure cooker and assigning them to those positions that, that, uh, or those um, events that gave them life that gained, it gave me perspective on my emotions, gave me a perspective on where, when some of these idiosyncrasies manifested, I could understand where they came come from. And it wasn't as, uh, wasn't as upsetting as it otherwise could have been. But then when you get back to the, you go on to the next, there's still that underlying spiritual something. And I'm not a, I don't mean religious. When I say spiritual, I don't mean religious. Um, I mean, my, for me, spirituality is kind of where I fall out in the universe um, between good and good and evil, maybe um, right, wrong. I don't know. That's, those are um, generalities that I'd need to, I need to find out where I sit on that spectrum every day. And uh, it doesn't, it's not a religious thing for me, but I had to figure out after having killed people and after having been in those situations, where did I fall on that spectrum? Where am I? Um, and uh getting that uh, getting that assistance from the VA helped me with that. Um, writing helped me identify that. But it also um, so okay, those three those three things, kind of where physical, emotional, and spiritual, for me, um, I had to hit them in that angle in that uh, that order. Um, journaling was something that I had done a little bit of while I was in and while I was, while I was in combat. Um, it wasn't so much a journal as it was a, an after action who, where, when, what, why, and just keeping track of things like that. Um, there were no emotions associated with it. It wasn't until I took my journal, my co-pilot's journal, my flight records, my videos and everything like that, and was able to set out those those combat tours in um in sequence the the events and put them to dates and then put events on those days and then was able to rebuild where i had been flying at various times and what uh, events had taken place in those various locations it wasn't until i was able to do that that i had any sort of framework in which to actually decompartmentalize and take those emotions and hang them on the events that gave them birth so the the journaling and the writing aspect was for me the the critical um component uh it it allowed me to decompartmentalize because it takes and it it allowed me to pull out that soup and pull the pieces out of it um and reverse engineer kind of the soup and figure out what came from where um which was important very important for me um yeah. yeah and you know dan i think that i think that's where those three components that's the internal territory the physical the emotional and the spiritual i think so often we get stuck on the physical you know in my case it was how many ultra marathons could i run before i eventually killed myself but it didn't matter how many i ran there were still the memories or i call them the wolves just trailing me about 200 kilo, 200 meters away just waiting for me to stop and then they would surround me so I think it's that realization that there's <clears throat> three components to our recovery, which is we need to take care of our spirit, our physical till the day we die. Because when we neglect that, when we drink it away, when we eat it away, when we try and skydive it away or spearfishing it away, it's, it's part of the solution, but not, it's not enough. I think you nail it when you talk about then starting to unpack the emotional, which can be, in your case, not only in the presence of another, but also through your own personal journaling and unpacking and decompartmentalizing. And then I think the spiritual component in whatever way it is for people is critical. And I think those three form the triangle of healing. How has it been for you? You know, let's move now a little bit beyond continuing action. How has it been for you over the years in your healing and coming back into your life, coming back into your family? But also, what is still left on the edges of yourself that you need to watch? Yeah, that's a 
That's a great question, Barry. And, and you know, as we've talked about, the reality is that this section, this this journey never ends, or it does. It ends when you die, but you're you're constantly going to be passing through this uh, these challenges. Um, there's never a a all free, all sound, all, the all clear doesn't sound, and you just move on to happily ever after. That's that's not reality. That's fairy tale. And so, you know, I still, um, I, I still have my ups and downs. I still get through periods where I'm overly judgmental on myself and and get really down on myself for for failures perceived or 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 real. Um, and that forms an echo chamber that I have to, I have to consciously step out of and go, no, you know, you're, you're doing it again. And that's what, that's what the benefit of having done all this work and having done all this writing and having thought about this for so long, I can see it when I'm doing it and go, all right, you need to go do something. You need to, you need to shake this up. And what does shaking it up mean for, for me? Um, you know, couple summers ago and I'm going to do it again this summer I hope um I just went I went hiking for six days I packed up a backpack and fly fishing gear and I went up in the mountains and I slept next to a, a lake and I woke up with the sun I went to sleep with the sun and I fished and I just sat there and didn't talk didn't have anybody else to talk to and didn't want anybody else to talk to um and it was one of the most peaceful experiences of my life and it's there all the time it's that experience is is just a couple hours away, and it, it's actually closer if I want to uh, I want to find a, a different location. And so, realizing and taking those steps when I when I know I need them is a a critical bit of wisdom that I've pulled out of this. Is that ignoring it isn't going to help, and minor adjustments aren't going to help. I know what I need in order to recenter when I, when I get off kilter and it's generally peace and quiet It's generally nature. And sometimes that's being able to go out diving in the kelp. And that's just a, that's a, a level of, of nature that can really recenter me. Sometimes it takes more than that. And I need to go for a hike and, and go camping. Um, and I really am, am blessed that that's an option. Um, but these, yeah, the, the journey doesn't end. Um, keep coming back around to that. Um, it also, there's a big factor here or a big uh, component that I think will resonate with, with most of this, uh, this audience. And that's a component of, of service and of giving back and of working for something greater than, than yourself. You know, that's what we all do when we serve. That's what we all do, whether it's in the, in the, uh, the military or in law enforcement or first responder, you're, you're serving others. Um, and it's important to keep that in mind and have some facet, have some aspect of your life, which does serve others, which is, um, and that's, I think an, an important component. Um, and something that, that I realized, uh, in myself that, you know, I needed more of that. And so I'm, I'm embarking on a, uh, um, embarking on a career change myself, uh, have, have applied. I'm, I'm in the background investigation process for a law enforcement position here in San Diego. And I'm really excited for that to pretend to be serving again. Um, so I'm really hopeful that that, uh, that that comes through and that, uh, I'm able to move forward in that because it, it feels very right when I, when I fast forward, okay, let's say I get hired and I fast forward two, three, four years, a decade, it feels really right to have been spending that time helping others, um, again. And I, so yeah, I think it's a, the journey is never ending and if all you gain by going through it is a little bit more wisdom as to what you need at various, uh, various turning points. And, um, you know, if you have that, then I think you're better off than, uh, a lot of folks. Yeah, Dan, I, I really want to say just thank you. I mean, I think we could keep this conversation going for days. But I think the gift is that, you know, everyone here and, and so many around have, have made these extraordinary journeys, but we're not going to be here one day. Our time will come. And I think for those that do leave something behind that is 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 a a map and a compass to healing, 
Um, that's the greatest gift we can leave. And I think your books really embody um, that gift. You know, I, I look at those, and I mean, I'm, I, I sit with them, always really close to me. It's just even holding them. I know that if I need to go to a place, I can go in there and there you are and there's your map and there's your experiences and I don't feel alone. They're the tools you use and some of it I resonate with and a lot of it I resonate with. And I think I want to, just from my point of view, thank you because the more we can share the journey that you've described, the more we can create life where there is no hope. The more that professionals are willing to pick up your books, for example, and read them, the more they are in a better position to be able to receive the kind of things that people are willing to share because they will know that in your body you understand them without judgment. Um, so thanks, Dan. Um, I just, you are a gift and you're an extraordinary human. And today you've brought your journey alive and taken us through your backstory, your after actions, and your continuing actions. And I really hope that this leaves a lot behind for people to pick up on. But I thought this would be a really good chance for people now to um, to ask questions. So, yeah, if anybody's got anything they want to bounce off Dan, that would be a pleasure. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, thank you, my friend. Dan, I, I have this memory of a, of a day in August in, in Najaf where some 30 millimeter note 30 millimeter, not 20 millimeter, went through a building um, with a fact in it. D do I have that right? Did that happen? Yes, yes, uh, you do. Um, yeah, we're we're holed up about 600 meters south of the uh, Imam Ali Mosque. And, uh, you know, it, I forget what, it was in the morning, um, probably 110 degrees already. And uh, yeah, we were on the roof and controlling a section of, of uh, Apaches um, on a six line. And on a six line brief, you just basically give a, a you know, you make sure they, that they know where you're located and then um, have them uh, shoot a certain azimuth and, and uh, heading out in front of you towards the target. And so we called out a sniper position to the, uh, to the Apaches and uh, they fired, um, what I didn't realize was that they had stayed very, very low. I couldn't quite see them. So it was almost a, a type two control. Um, and then I knew they were behind me and they, they basically lined up on top of my flag behind straight over top to the, uh, uh, to the enemy positions. And they yeah put a couple of rounds the, the 30 mil dipped just a little bit. Um, they had a, a mechanical failure as they described it. Um, and uh, sent, yeah, probably six or eight 30 millimeter rounds into the back of my building um, that uh, luckily we, luckily nobody got hit, um, but it was a, um, a very dusty and loud experience. Awesome. That was a, uh, that was a real learning point for, for all of us that were operating there. Don't, don't do that. Don't hurt you, Shine and Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> I much appreciate that. Yes. Thanks, Casey. Um, anyone else here have a question they'd like to uh, bounce off Dan? I think Rich's hand is up. It's uh, it's. Oh, hard. sorry, Rich. Yep, colorblind. Yeah, Rich. Yeah. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your courageous service. Um, I'm also a, a docent down at the uh, Marine Corps Museum, and we're supposed to get a uh, cobra, but they're trying to figure out how they're going to hang it. <laughs> Uh, and I thought the I thought the Apache longbow was a beast until I I became familiar with the cobra. But uh, but thank you for for all you've done and continue to do. God bless you. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate that. Well, I can pop in real quick, um, Dan. That was incredible. That was an incredible share. Uh, thank you for being so so generous with your story. I think the way that you're able to articulate your journey is, um, it's just profound. You don't hear that all the time. And, and then Barry, once again, the questions and the depth of your, uh, just, you know, interviewing and facilitating this, um, I, I just appreciate it. I, I just see it as very generous. 
I also think Dan too, I think as a civilian, <clears throat> when we hear stories like this, like somebody shared a, their story, a veteran shared his story with me. And that's why I'm doing this today. I think, you know, it was, it's, it's a, it's huge. I think for a civilian to realize the true sacrifice that somebody makes when they sign on that line. And I think you just helped again um, to get the word out, like what does war, what is the cost of war? And you shared so beautifully, I'm very moved. And um, thank you. I, also, I hope for you that on the rest of your journey and anybody else who is working through this, that you will treat yourself with a lot of compassion as you work through this soup. So I just, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate that. And Dan, yeah. as a final um, gift from you, um, what would you like to leave behind um, that you feel can be a light for people to hold on to as they move into the healing? Yeah. So I think that kind of the, the last takeaway I'd like to leave is just that there's no expiration date on starting your journey. You know, you might've been home for two weeks. You might've been home for two decades. It might've been 50 years ago, whatever. You never, it's never too late to start unpacking this stuff and to, and to take the first step, um, whatever that step is in your own life, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything to do it. And it could actually, uh, really improve the, the amount of time you have left. Um, so yeah, I, I think that would be the only thing that I would, I would leave is just this stuff doesn't go away on its own. And if you haven't processed it and gone back through some of this stuff, the time is, you can always, you can always do it and yeah, can make things make a big difference. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And, um, you know, when I look at guys like Rich, Dave, myself, I mean, Rich, it's hard to know where you're at, but, you know, we guys in our 70s now. And uh, and giving the your date stamp, Rich, you're probably close behind, if not ahead. But, um, you know, now we're facing a time clock. Uh, we can't pretend that we're immortal, but we keep doing the work. We keep getting up every day and taking care of the physical and the emotional and the spiritual. So it never stops. And when our time comes for us to go, I think the words and the actions that we leave behind, the books that we leave behind, they call forth another generation of souls trying to manage their wounds and, and move back into life and into health. So thanks, Dan. Um, this was an absolute pleasure. Um, I've wanted to spend time with you for a long time and to thank you for the impact that your books have had on my life and continue to have in my life and for those listening seriously get dan's books get his second book you know the book is not always easy to read because it challenges you to put effort into your life it's not just a who you are story about action it demands effort to create change and if you're not going to put effort in and uh, face the claymores that we carry um, you're going to stay where you are which is a pity so get that second book and try journaling it works so thanks, Dan, and um, what a pleasure. And I wish you well on your journey ahead. And uh, I hadn't, this is the first time I've heard about you moving into uh, law enforcement, which I have a son who is um, in the police here in Australia. So um, I wish you well in that journey in your life. Thank you. Thank you very, very much um, for, for doing this. Um, this has been an absolute pleasure for me. And it's uh, been great seeing all these faces and look forward to more conversations in the future. Yeah, thank you.